The terraforming program at the Strelka Institute can be defined as the search for a viable artificial plan for an alternative planetarity. One of the least viable aspects of our current planetary operations is the way that we metabolize the energy to power cities, industries and ourselves in the form of food. In 2050, there will be 9.7 billion people on Earth. In order to feed them, the global food system will need to produce 70% more calories than it currently does and must do so in a way that is equitable, nutritious, ecologically sustainable and carbon negative. What might that look like? There are already clues. Chernozyum, or Black Earth, is the most fertile soil on the planet. It can be found on the Eurasian steppe the North American prairies and in the Amazon basin, where it is known as terra preta. Terra preta is an absorbent regenerative soil, rich in minerals and microbial life. It was formed when indigenous farmers threw bones, waste and shattered pottery on the ground outside their kitchens and then enhanced the soil with charcoal. Black soil, then, is artificial. An anthropogenic process of terraformation that was designed and managed to benefit both humans and the land. Agriculture has always terraformed, but it is not only food and landscapes that are produced. For thousands of years, farmers have collected rain tables, seed cycles and lunar charts in almanacs, portable databases of earth science and prediction that standardised agricultural practice and were sites for speculation about man's place within the cosmos. When crop rotation, irrigation and domesticated cattle were adopted in Mesopotamia, Mesoamerica and the Indus Valley, they brought writing, taxation and urban settlement with them, establishing dietary staples and farming models that remain in place today. Harnessing the chemical power of plants and cereals, territory and climate, humans created a synthetic landscape that exploded with the arrival of nitrogen and phosphate fertilisers, deployed to secure the yields required by a growing population. Food and culture are indivisibly entwined. In Sumer, grain was offered to the gods before being tallied, apportioned and stored in granaries outside the temple. When the gods didn't eat, the people did cementing the link between ritual ingestion and societal complexity. But the connection goes deeper still. When humans eat, molecules bind with sensory receptors in the mouth and retronasal passageway, activating spatial patterns in the olfactory bulb as we breathe out. These signals combine with information from the other senses to form a neural cascade that passes through the emotion and memory processing structures in the brain before becoming conscious perception. The experience of flavour, then, is as automatic as breathing, yet as intimate as dreaming. What's more, the food molecules we sense evolved to carry out specific functions like communication between plants, self-defence, or to respond to environmental shifts. In a quite literal sense, we can taste the operations of the biosphere. Because these molecules combine with images, language and memory, we can taste ideology as well. Most of the food we encounter in our day-to-day -day lives is not intended for consumption. Instead, we see simulated images of food in the form of advertising, product packaging, on menus, supermarket shelves and social media, building on a semiotics of agrarian simplicity and limitless nature that we first encounter as children. Consider the major food trends of the 2010s. Fast food classics elevated for a fast casual audience. Sentimental localism and fake rusticity reproduced for the global market. In food, as in music, we are stuck in a stylistic feedback loop defined by skeuomorphism and conservatism, undernourished by slick remixes of last century's genres. Think about the food served on airplanes. This is not food designed to embrace the particular conditions of gastronomy at high altitude, but an attempt to recreate cafe culture in the sky. Pigments are added to the carrots so they appear fresh. The lasagna is coloured to look as though oven-baked. Food becomes little more than a tool to manufacture normalcy at 30,000 feet, and it is to this performance which all research and development capital flows.
Yet there are interruptions to this process. The so-called horse meat scandal of 2013, in which beef lasagnas turned out to contain horse skin, wood chippings and other scrapings from a series of factories across Europe, revealed an ontological breach between consumers and the food they eat. But it also demystified the means of industrial production at continental scale. Similarly, in 2020, when states began urging citizens to eat the surpluses of Wagyu beef, Belgian fries and French cheese that had begun to mount during the early stages of the COVID-19 outbreak, a bit like wartime rationing in reverse, they revealed a series of automated supply chains that could be steered to greater ends. Displays of abundance have been instrumentalised throughout history to indicate the general health of the system that produced it. Yet the plenitude of a corporate organic market is a lie which has the inverse effect of making shopping seem like a radical act. And still, the sentimental association of A is for apple and B is for banana, first encountered in children's books, remains the veil behind which geochemical meltdown is disguised. The processes by which we convert the biotic surface of the Earth and make it edible are responsible for almost a third of total greenhouse gas emissions, 75% of all deforestation and the vast majority of biodiversity loss. Agriculture uses 70% of total freshwater withdrawals and has already degraded half the planet's soil. At the same time, at least 1.3 billion tonnes of food are wasted every year and one in three people are malnourished. Three quarters of the birds alive today are farmed poultry. The accumulation of chicken bones in landfill sites since 1950 is considered a large enough entry in the fossil record to signal the commencement of the Anthropocene. There is no condition of pastoral innocence to which we can return. In fact, liberating food from the performance of an idealised past may require more alienation rather than less. Chorni Almanach, or Black Almanach, embraces artificiality and the chemical materialist potential of food as a locus for planetary transformation. It's a plan for 2050 that outlined 31 fundamental steps, from infrastructure to institutions, one per growing season, to construct a viable food system by the autumn of that year. The first change must be to the way we fund agriculture. We are often taught that a suspicion of new tastes, textures, experiences and sensations is the primary obstacle for emerging food cultures to overcome. But there is an economic barrier too. More than a million dollars of public money are spent every minute on subsidies that fund destructive farming practices and determine the ingredients, recipes and products we consume. This hidden infrastructure is the reason farmers cannot grow the crops best suited to their land and why the principal function of American agribusiness is the distribution and reformulation of corn syrup and soy. The shift in attitude towards lobster once considered a parasite suitable only for fertiliser and animal feed, or the incorporation of a Japanese raw fish diet into the global mainstream, might provide a roadmap for insect proteins, precision fermentation and cellular meat. What it teaches is that edibility is not innate in things, but is contingent upon knowledge, practice and accessibility. We already eat insects in the form of food colouring. We eat copper, iron and zinc to improve our health. We regularly ingest that which might seem harmful and use harmful substances to suggest edibility, as in food photography, where meat is basted with motor oil to glisten on cue, and ice cream is more likely to be dyed wall filler than anything that could melt under a hot studio light. Children's books and marketing are not the only means by which food cultures are engineered. After the Russian Revolution, apartments were built without kitchens in order to free families from the burden of bourgeois household economy. Instead, neighbours were to eat in canteens known as factory kitchens, a public feeding infrastructure in which mass production and communal dining were combined to balance nutrition with the erratic surpluses and deficits of the planned economy. What might a new factory kitchen include if it were built around a concept of planetary cuisine? Fast food is often criticised, but slow food cannot scale to meet our requirements. Movements like molecular gastronomy maximise hedonic pleasure at the expense of nourishment. Yet the design of food for space travel 
another possibility for culinary innovation, reveals an archive of nourishment without desire. A contemporary factory kitchen would utilize the full potential of platform food and incorporate technologies suited to intensive agriculture at the urban scale. When food is labeled according to its true cost, flavor becomes a cognitive engine that kickstarts the geoengineering process by aligning our appetites with molecular elements and flows. We were not the first species to terraform Earth. 2.4 billion years ago, cyanobacteria began producing oxygen as a byproduct of photosynthesis, wiping out the majority of nitrogen dependent life forms and triggering the first ice age. Blue green algae has already transformed the planet and might soon do so again. Algae is a mineral rich food source that can be grown in all weathers and harvested year round. In Moscow, Spirulina has been successfully trialled as a means to filter river water, and in Copenhagen it forms the main input for a range of specialty caviar. And there are other non-human alchemists already working at planetary scale. Deep subsurface bacteria accounts for 13% of the planet's biomass. Scientists at biotech venture Join Bio are using synthetic biology to modify soil microbes so they can synthesise nitrogen directly from the atmosphere, boosting yields while reducing the need for industrial fertilizers. In Shandong province, China, cockroaches are being used to process food and kitchen waste, a trial run for a new system that safely consumes old food by producing new food for humans. Given their potential as a source of protein and a rich history of insect gastronomy from South America, Africa and Asia, the place of crickets, beetles, mealworms and locusts in the food system to come is already assured. When the space probes Voyager 1 and 2 left Earth in 1977, their payload included a golden record that contained images of food provision and consumption, raising a behaviour that might seem banal or incidental to one of cosmic, even species-defining scope. Systematic agriculture emerged out of the black soil of the Nile River Delta, a technical laboratory from which the words alchemy and chemistry also descend. Almanacs, like diets, recipes and cookbooks, are not only instructions for transforming matter. They are protocols for the production of self and society, foregrounding a process of decomposition and recombination that is the central logic of both chemistry and cooking. Humans account for just 0.01% of Earth's biomatter, a tiny fraction that needs to be recast according to its capacities and responsibilities. Yet even within that 0.01% live billions of microorganisms in the hair, throat, stomach and gut. Ancient invaders that work in collaborative symbiosis with their hosts to aid digestion and monitor immune health. There is no barrier between humans and nature, no outside to which we do not belong. Instead, there is a garden of interdependent aliens, and it is the recognition of this alienation that will be crucial in making Earth a second home.